Hello, my name is Tiffany Florval, and I'm an associate professor at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. The past tells us about the present and the future. The past tells us how Germans have become Germans. It tells us how race works. It tells us how it functioned. It tells us how racialization works how exclusion works, how issues of belonging work. So the past is a great way of understanding the present and seeing where we're going in the future. Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to this episode of the Researching Diversity Podcast. I am Charlene Pevich, and I am a doctoral researcher and lecturer in the Inclusive Education Department at the University of Potsdam. And I am Tuche Aral. I am a doctoral researcher and lecturer in the same team. Today, Charlene and I are hosting Tiffany Florville, an associate professor at the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, in the United States. So for our listeners, what can you expect from this episode? First, we talk to Tiffany Flowell about race in Europe, which is a topic that is increasingly gaining interest among both the researchers and practitioners. Then we reflected on how she became interested in Black German experiences through her personal experience in Germany and her research from a history perspective. Later on, we delved into the topics such as the role of German colonial history in the construction of German national identity, the normalization of whiteness in Europe, connection between anti-Semitism anti-Muslim and anti-Black racism in the afterwar period in Europe. On a more personal level, she also shares helpful advices for minoritized scholars. It was a wonderful experience to meet Tiffany Florell and to learn from her research on race in Europe from a historical perspective. We hope you enjoy listening to our episode too, and we can say let's start with the episode. Welcome, Professor Tiffany Florville, and thank you for being here with us. And as in every episode, uh, we'll start talking about the past. So I want to ask you this big question of why did you become interested in the topic of race in Europe? Yeah, that's a big question and a good question. I was an exchange student in Germany many years ago, and I lived with a host family in Hamburg And just had all of these interesting racialized experiences. I was called the N-word at my gymnasium. People would, you know, associate me with, I guess, sort of some of the drug dealers who were in Hamburg in which I was allegedly connected to them. They're just sort of strange. You know, people oftentimes call them microaggressions, but they really were macroaggressions where I just kept thinking, this is a lot of racism. And I kept thinking, I thought Germans weren't racist. Um, and so I was naive. I was maybe 18 or 19. And I was like... This is a lot of racism going on. How are communities of color, Black communities in particular, dealing with German racism in these forms? And how are they responding to them? Um, and so initially I was actually interested in Turkish German literature and Turkish German ways of coping. And then I, because of my heavily racialized experiences in Germany, I became more interested in Black German experiences and wondering how they were dealing with this because... It was difficult in ways. So I just thought it'd be very, not interesting, very rewarding to study responses to racism. So not only sort of thinking about it as like, there's racism in Germany, but thinking about resistance and survival in the German landscape and what that looked like. Yeah, I think that's very interesting because your story goes back to 90s, right? And how did you then transfer to this, your area of research of history? So did it like start it back then or was it more like, uh, you know, put it in the side and I will deal with it later? I mean, I think when I came back from the exchange year, I was like, ooh, German literature, German literature, but minority literature. I and mean, I was like, ooh, what can I get? What can I read? Um, but I had to, of course, take courses where we had to read Kunto Klaas and all of these other, you know, canonical figures in the German literature. But I was always like, what about Black Germans? Or, you know, I took a class about Jewish women writers. And so I tried to, like, create a sense of, like, a broader spectrum of what the German canon of literature could look like. 
And then I was just intrigued by the transnational connections that emerge between, you know, Black German activists and sort of individuals across the globe. Namely, one of those individuals was Af- Audre Lorde, an African-American poet or Afro-Caribbean poet. And so I was like, huh, I'd like to sort of study this. So I was both a German literature and languages major and a history major at undergrad and almost went to graduate school for German literature, but was like, no, I'll do history and still include German literature in the history track. And I'm curious also, so for me, for example, as an outsider that we can call, because I moved to Germany four years ago and um, from Turkey, and for me, this history or the history of Germany and Black people, Black Germans, it was not connected in my mind. So it didn't, as an outsider, I never thought there are people who are German, but also who have African descent since centuries and stuff. So for me, it was very interesting. Like I only realized that after I come here and then after I come across with um, May I am, as you said, like Audre Lorde and these authors. And then in the end, I found your book too, like very recently. So I mean, so that's why it's very also um, invisible. Have you felt that before you came to Germany? Absolutely. I think that I had no concept of Black people in Germany. I mean, there was one Black boy in my neighborhood. So people would be like, look, there's another, you know, I'd be like, hey, I see you. We'd be like on the on the bus, I'd like wave to him and we'd smile. But I always thought, for example, that like the presence of Black people in Germany was sort of tied to the Second World War, not really thinking about, you know, earlier incarnations. And like, I don't think I grasped that Germany even had colonies when I was an exchange student. So it was basically when I went back to the U.S. and I was like, wait a minute, that I like did more research. And I was like, ooh, Germany had colonies, not only in Africa, but also in the Pacific. So when we think about these legacies, we need to think about like a larger understanding of German colonialism, which was short-lived, but those assumptions, those stereotypes, those ways of how German identity and German national identity and citizenship were constructed took place in the colonies. And so I think it's really important to recognize how race how the German colonial project was a project about racecraft as well and statecraft. And with them, we, of course, see that in later moments in the 20th century Germany. But I had no concept of this until after my exchange year. And so I think it wasn't until I went back to the U.S. that I learned about Fab and that I learned even more about like who Maya Im was, Katorina Gantoya, and this larger dynamic of like Black German history and culture that spans like multiple centuries. So I think that also shook my mind that I was like, wait, it's not just a 20th century thing? Like, oh, it's actually like a Middle Ages thing that you have people of African descent living in a variety of areas in what were just discrete German territories? That's fascinating. So... I was not aware of that. And quite honestly, I was in gymnasium, but I also did like history Leistungs course because I was like, oh, I like history. But, you know, our history Leistungs course never touched on like German colonialism, you know, never like that wasn't even an idea. And then my English Leistungs course didn't really read like African-American literature either or people of African descent. It was basically like Britain or other authors who were oftentimes just white. Oftentimes they were all white. Like there were no people of color in that license course, in both license courses. So I was like, what's going on here? What does this reveal about like the silences too in pedagogy where you don't have, you can't see yourself in the curriculum. Like you can't see other people of color. You can't see other ways of knowing that aren't just sort of white or Western. I can agree that I think it still continues. So I think that's why we need to um, talk more about these issues because you talk about a different time, like maybe 19s, maybe the 2000s, but now we're like, you know, the time is passing. 21st century. Exactly. Time is passing and we have to change things in every part of the education, universities and Okay, so I'm just, one thing that I'm really, also I want you to get your opinion about. So for me, what I've realized, as you said that, you know, I wasn't so more interested in or knew more about the Turkish migrant migration history in Germany, having relatives. So I didn't have this concept of other people from other countries. But also when I was looking for books, as you said, there was this book Farba Bekenen from May Ayim and other authors. And I, they were German 
right? So they were in German and as a German learner person, so for me, it was kind of hard to read their voices, what they have written. So I bought that book and I start reading because I'm trying to improve my German. So it, it, it kind of made sense. Like I, I start um, reading, but then I kept looking for like English books that translated or that can tell me more about the Afro-German women voices and these queer feminist voices in these books. But I didn't find it until... This is this is how I want to get the conversation to your book until I found your book. Because for your book was more of a, okay, so now I can read what they have done in English. But I was also surprised that's very um, recent. So can you tell me whether we, like there were other books that were published in English or how did you decide to write this book? Did you see this gap too? Or did you see that... That was something necessary. So I'm, I'm curious why you wrote this book, Mobilizing Black Germany. Yeah, that's a good question. So when I initially applied for graduate school in the U.S., I applied thinking I would write about like Black German feminism and Audre Lord. I mean, I certainly write about that in the book, but it's not the only thing I write about. And there was resistance. I wanted to write about Black people in Europe people of African descent in Europe. And there was certainly resistance to doing that type of work. So I eventually had to leave that institution and I went to another institution, which was also not easy because there was sort of resistance about, just resistance to the approaches of history that I wanted to do, which certainly I'm a trained historian, but I am also drawing on like Black feminism, sociology, you know, queer theory, all of these things that are not within the confines of history alone. And I got some pushback. So I remember going to my first German Studies Association conference and presenting on Black Germans. And the question from white Germanists in the audience was, why is this important? How many Black Germans are they? So basically, um, I had to come up with an answer. So those experiences, I was like, Black Germans are about this, this. These are the percentages of them. This is a comparable to the percentage of Jews prior to the Second World War. So like, this is a number that I had to be like, you know, either 500,000 to half a million to maybe like 800,000. These numbers are comparable to the numbers of Jews in the Second World War. Then people would be like, oh, but you had to play that numbers game. Like these numbers, you know, like these are the numbers, but the issues that, yeah, it's always like these number game. Like I'm like, can't these narratives be important regardless of the number of people? Because they say something about German national identity as being really fixed to whiteness. Like, that's the issue at play is that national identity is fixed to whiteness. And anything that doesn't match that, anything that is against the norm is rendered invisible or bad. And so this is why I felt compelled to write about it, because... Black Germans represent a very interesting dynamic within African diaspora history, too. It's not a discussion necessarily that is tethered to slavery and colonialism like in other cases. It's like a different way of thinking about the Middle Passage. Like you don't necessarily think about the Middle Passage for Black Germans because you have various waves of generations of Black Germans coming to Germany, not all through um, colonialism, some in indirect ways, but not necessarily all direct So I think it represents really interesting dynamics about African diasporic history, which basically is not only tethered to the Middle Passage and slavery um, and imperialism, even though those ideas are important, but it really gets us to see that the diaspora has always been dynamic. It's always entailed a, a variety of stories. And then it also helps us, I think, with terms of German history, that like whiteness is normalized. It is so entrenched in German culture that they can't even see it. Like they see it, but they don't see it. They, you know, it's so for some they see it. And they, of course, the AFD sees it. Um, Alternative for Deutschland. And they're trying to reimagine what that Germany is when we center whiteness and do away with like the alleged Islamization of Europe. But it's all embedded in like everyday institutions and structures in Germany in which they don't call out whiteness for whiteness. And there I want to ask you a question because that's a conversation that I had been having with other scholars in Europe we're try- always trying to write papers that we're trying to refer children a certain ways. For example, we say that children of immigrant descent or children of non-immigrant descent, for example. But most of the time in Europe that scholars and 
including me in my article, like we didn't use much more racialized terms like white German or German of color. And one thing that I've realized that um, when I ask some of other scholars, people do not want to equate this white German to children of non-immigrant descent. I always have this argument with other scholars and saying that, okay, white doesn't equate to the German context. So white is more of an American context, but not in the German context or Europe. I mean, maybe in Britain, they, of course, but in, in German context. So what would you say to that? Do you think? I'd say no. I think it does. And I think it's across Europe. That's the problem is that whiteness has been normalized. Maisha Uma, a Black German scholar, refers to the German whiteness as a super whiteness, tying back to this Aryan notions of who Germans should be. Um, I think this is a dynamic across Europe that like whiteness is so normalized that it oftentimes it's an unspoken normalization of what is supposed to be Europe. And then the same token, Europeans of color, Black Europeans, etc., are both rendered invisible, but also hyper-visible because they're presumed to be outside of the norm of what a European is supposed to be or what a German is supposed to be. And so when people say Biodeutsch, that means like they're white, white, they're white German that doesn't give access to Germans of color. There's a reason why people use Biodeutsch. And I always like joke and be like, oh, are they organic? Or like, am I going to go to Edeka and like a Biodeutsch drink or something like that? But the presumption is that they're really, really German. And that really, really German is tied to this notion of whiteness. I think Europe as a whole likes to say that, you know, whiteness, race, these are American imports, you know, like these are things that we don't really have an issue with. And it's a lie, like British colonialism, Um, Like, the U.S. was a colony of Britain. (laughs) Like, of course, it's learned techniques about racialization, racism from its former, the former British Empire. And it's also created its own in the process. So I think race is so, it's so ever present in the European context, certainly in the German context. But it's also very silenced and erased in the European context. So on the one hand, we can praise the British um, soccer players who are of African descent, you know, this year in terms of thinking about like, ooh, they did it. Sterling did it. But as soon as a game is lost, then the racial epithets come and the racism piles on. Same thing with the German soccer team. Utsu can be great when their Germans are winning, but then when they're losing and not doing well, yikes. And it's, there's a reason why he wrote a letter and it's like, I'm done. I'm done with this foolishness. So I do think there's this notion of whiteness in the German context that exists, that people have been trying to articulate. And I think that's also why the whiteness studies is maybe a little bit slower in the German context. Like the book that I'm referring to came out in 2005. So like that's an older book now. But there seems to be a limited engagement with whiteness as opposed to the U.S., which you could see like whiteness studies emerging in like the late 80s, early 90s in terms of thinking about scholars, especially in the U.S. context. So I think that Germans are reluctant to think about whiteness in that way, even though it's there. And it's really tied to these Aryan notions of who is German. And so I really sort of draw from like scholars of color in the German context who are writing about this. And so... And then you're right, like Fab Bekennen, I'm sorry, like I went off into a whole tangent, but like Fab Bekennen, stuff of that nature, they're showing our colors, which is the English version of Fab Bekennen, which was published in 1992. But a lot of the stuff is in, um, in German. And I think you have scholars like myself, like Priscilla Lane, Jamal Watkins, Tina Camp, Michelle Wright, on and on and on, who are talking about these dynamics in their work and who are talking about race and gender. They're thinking, they're talking about like other Germans, like Tina Camp's first book was Other Europeans, thinking about the Rhineland occupation, the French occupation of the Rhineland and the subsequent, you know, the subsequent relationships that occurred between white German women and French colonial soldiers and their offspring. And so I think there are people who are writing oftentimes from the U.S. um, who are writing about these things. But you also have scholars like Peggy Pisha, Maisha Uma. I mean, Peggy Pisha and Maisha Uma have been writing in German and in English. So, and they've been doing it for a while. Peggy Pisha has been writing about being a Black German in the East since the 90s and publishing it on both sides of the Atlantic. 
You also have Fatima El Taib. Her first book was about like German colonialism in German. And then she's also published a lot of articles about German citizenship and blood citizenship in the German context in English. So there's stuff out there, but you really do have to sleuth and look. And I think I wanted to write the book because everyone kept saying, why are you writing this? This is an important history. And I wanted to, part of it was like spite, like F you, I'm going to write this. And, you know, like, uh, like I'm going to do it. But then the the most important reason for me was that people needed to know this history because this history mattered. And so, I mean, it was more the history mattered than the spite, but the spite was there too, where I was like, I'm going to do this. You, I don't care what you say. Um, and so I think this history matters. It continues to matter. It matters that Black Germans and Germans of color were working together. It matters that they were pushing intersectional politics in the 80s, even before the term becomes coined by Kimberly Kenshaw. Um, so I think they represent a, a, an important aspect of modern German history that oftentimes is silenced or ignored. And so I was very keen on writing this history for, you know, German peeps and Germanists to recognize that, look, this history matters. And also for folks in, um, who've studied Black studies or the African diaspora to realize that, look, not everything revolves around Britain or France. <laughs> like, those are cool places, and we have dynamic histories from those places, but there's also dynamic histories emerging from the German context. Yes, thank you. I'm glad you did it. <laughs> so glad. And I had two questions on my mind, or three, but you answered two. One question would have been, if there have been challenges along the way of writing and publishing your book, Mobilizing Black Germany. And I think you said some things about it so listeners could go back and try to answer them for themselves. Or is there anything you want to add on that question? So about the challenging part of publishing. Oh, yeah. I think there's always a challenge because I also am not Black German. I never claimed to be Black German. And so I have to be aware of my positionality in pursuing this history too, which is always in the back of my mind that I'm not Black German. Am I doing this history justice? Am I being true to the sources and being true to the narratives that Black German activists have shared with me? So maintaining that balance for me has been important, but also hard. And people just didn't think I should even do this work. There are some Black Germans who thought I shouldn't do this work. There are some, certainly some Germanists who thought I shouldn't do this work. And I just was like, I'm going to do it. And I don't care. I do care in the sense that like, this is history. This is important. These are important narratives that need to be, that people need to know about in a larger scope. That they tell us so much about like issues of belonging, identity, citizenship, what that actually means, how German statecraft was built on notions of race, even in the colonial setting. So I think for me, it hasn't been easy, but I was committed to doing it, even though there are lots of rejections, lots of no's, and people just saying like, who are you and why are Black Germans important? And I'd be like, they're important because they matter. It doesn't matter how many numbers there are. They matter because they exist and challenged a system that didn't think they should be around. And it's something I mentioned to do because I tweet a lot and I mentioned this morning, you've got to do work that you want to do. Like people are going to try to stop you. And you just have to main, be, maintain the course and be true to who you are as a scholar and the work that you want to do. And so I think I maintain the course of like, F them all. <laughs> I won't curse, uh, although I, I do have a potty mouth, but I'm trying to be good. Um, like, I got to do this and I have to do it because it matters to me and it matters that other people learn about the significance of this. And so that's what I've tried to like maintain throughout the course of my earlier struggles. Yeah, and that captures really well the second question I had for you, that I thought there must be people arguing that anti-Black racism compared to maybe anti-Muslim racism or anti-Semitism is not as relevant in Germany or in other European contexts because the total amount of Black citizens is relatively small. So maybe again, for those who still not got it, and again, you can go back listen to this um, conversation again and you will find so many reasons. But maybe, again, what do these people need to know? What do they need to become aware of? Yeah, these are good questions. They need to be aware of that. Even in the process of Germany claiming it has expunged racism after the Second World War, that was a myth. 
They did not expunge racism after the Second World War, nor did they expunge anti-Semitism after the Second World War, given the legacy of anti-Semitism with the Third Reich. And so basic, largely anti-Black racism was intact after the Second World War. So there was an effort to sort of be less anti-Semitic, even though we know that that wasn't fully realized. And in relationship to that, we have to be cognizant of like the guest worker program too in the post-45 period that really fosters this sense of like, you know, becomes an anti-Turkish sentiment after Turkish individuals become the largest percentage of guest workers in this by the 70s. And so I think we have to see anti-Muslim, anti-Semitism, anti-Black racism, all is connected in terms of how racialization works in the German context. And what is normalized? Whiteness is normalized. A particular type of German culture is also normalized. This is why the rhetoric of the 70s with regards to sort of Turkish guest workers was like, oh, if they assimilate, they'll be fine. You know, if they become what we want them to become, they'll be fine. No, they don't need to become you. They can be them, you know, like this is not how culture works. And so I think this is a dynamic across Europe too, in which the presumption is that like, we've purged race after the Second World War. Like we've did, you know, we defeated the Nazis. Racism isn't going to be a problem. And we can see with post-war labor migration across Europe, France, Britain, that racism never left. <laughs> continues to have strong roots and strong anti-Black roots in the British case. When we think about migrants from the Commonwealth countries like Jamaica or Trinidad, who were coming as British citizens to Britain, they were Commonwealth citizens, but were presumed to not be citizens, were presumed to be, were treated as second-class citizens. Um, and you could see those dynamics at play in the, in the post-45 period in Britain. You could see that in France with Maghreb immigrants who are coming and the presumptions that are made by Maghreb immigrants, African immigrants, and immigrants who are coming from Martinique. And so you see all of these anti-Black sentiments uh, still having significance because they're also tied to a, a colonial past in Europe, a colonial past that still has teeth, still has significance, even though we're in a alleged post-colonial moment and we've experienced decolonization the legacy of colonialism, the afterlives of colonialism in terms of presumption, stereotypes, symbols still remain significant across Europe. And Germany is not excluded from that. I think this brings us to our next section then, the present. So we want to talk about the text you brought today, or in this time it's a book. So which text did you bring today? I brought a great book that I teach and that I also love by Robin Mitchell, Venus Noir, and she focuses on Black women in 19th century France. And I think it's a really amazing book because it tells us that Black women matter to the French imagination of themselves. The book talks about how France was trying to deal with the loss of Haiti and that it used Black women's bodies to do so, to enact gendered norms, racialized norms, and to sort of dictate what was to be appropriate behavior for French women and men. And so the book covers, you know, three amazing women um, who offer as, who become symbols for how France is working through its issues of losing its, you know, most profitable colony to Black enslaved insurrectionists. And so it deals with how they're dealing with race, gender, and nation in really amazing ways. And Robin is also just a great historian. And it encourages me. I mean, Robin looked at a few things in my book before I submitted it. And so like, I did have her perspective in the book. She looked at my intro and was like, oh my God. And I was like, is it bad? And she was like, no, it's good. It's good. And so I was like, okay, thanks. Don't say, oh my God, because I thought it was bad. And she just writes with such clarity in that book that I think, and it's a short book, so people, students can read it. It's like a hundred and something pages, but it does a good job of showing how Black women's bodies factored in. So one of the chapters is on Sarah Bartman, who is, you know, derisively referred to as the hot top Venus, and it talks about her tours, 
how her body was dissected by French scientists and the lies that French scientists, the un, the bias that was at play when they're writing about Black bodies, specifically Sarah Bartman's body. So it's a very good book, and it really opens your mind to sort of think about the place that people of African descent had in the 19th century. Certainly it's in a context of, you know, enslavement and colonialism, but it also shows you the symbolic value that many of these individuals had and the tensions that they create for, you know, the French empire, which I think is quite lovely. I think you shared great thoughts on why you think this book is an outstanding one. And I want to continue asking you, and we do this in every episode, so if you had to explain the core messages of this book, which is quite challenging, to your grandma, how would you do this? Ooh, I like that. The core messages are Black women become important for how France imagines itself in the 19th century in very interesting ways. The second message is that like science is never value-free. When she offers these discussions about Sarah Bartman and you see scientists writing about her, you realize that their their objectivity is not objectivity. It's imbued with a lot of subjective meaning and that they're really writing racist ideas about Black women's bodies from the get-go that then becomes normalized as objective, which was never, it was never objective. And third, that even though these, you know, she talks about three disparate women, Orika, Sarah Bartman, And I forgot the third one, but my brain is, you know, all over the place right now. But she talks about these three different women in different moments in the 19th century and how they all were fighting back in their own ways. That like Black resistance can still exist even when the cards are stacked against you. And that was interesting that each of these moments, you know, at one moment, one French scientist wants to see Sarah Bartman's naked body. And she says no. That's an act of resistance. That's a powerful act of resistance. She certainly was marginalized and oppressed because she's toured around Europe and her body is a, you know, becomes a spectacle for European males. And but she says no. She's like, I won't let you do that. And that means something. And some of the and she offers examples of that for the other two women in the book. So black women help France reimagine itself. Science is never value free, and black women could resist in their own ways. Thank you so much for sharing. I think that's so helpful, so clear, so easy to follow. And maybe for our listeners, that's also helpful if they have a look at this book or buy it and read it. And of course, we always will link the important info. And I want to ask you, and you shared again, you, you shared so much about this, but how did this book impact your work or your way of thinking? Yeah, I mean, it came out, her book came out almost a year before mine, but it really demonstrates the importance of expanding our view about individuals of African descent in Europe. Like, I'm sure I'm a 20th century historian, a scholar of 20th century. I don't maintain any, any sense that I'm like a colonial scholar. But she, her book reminds me that Black people have always existed in Europe and that in the 19th century, a key moment for European empires, French, British empire, that you had individuals of African descent really helping to shape what those national identities were supposed to be. So like... Black women were not what the French national ideal was supposed to be. Black people were not what the British national identity was supposed to mean. And so that helps us understand these nation states in the 19th century, that they always needed an other to help construct themselves and to help reimagine themselves. So in many ways, these people become a mirror in the sense of like, this is not what we want. And this is not who we want to be. And so that, her book reminds me of that. And then a second reminder is, and this is something I teach in my classes too, because I taught a Black Lives Matter course in the spring um, and I had them read the book and she came to the class as well, is that we oftentimes think about 19th century science as being this beacon of progress. You know, this moment of like, ooh, rationality and the like. And it is so subjective. It is so filled with value. And it is not as objective as it is. And it's never been. And her book reminds me of that. Like, science is not value-free. Even in the Enlightenment period, it was not value-free. And it remains that way, 
in the 19th century and certainly in the 20th century with medical racism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So like science is never always subjective in ways and shaped by social and cultural dynamics too. Yeah, good to keep that in mind. Also, when we think about intersectionality, I think that's Again, such a prompt topic. We have this coming up in so many episodes when we talk with female researchers, female professors, and all of our team. Like, we're all women being parts of marginalized groups. So, and that's a huge question, but can you share your thoughts on how we can address intersectionality in and outside of work when interacting with people or in the way we think we are thinking about ourselves and of others? I think for me is intersectionality described as the many identities that I have and the many marginalized identities that keep getting the brunt of discrimination in a variety of ways. And so for me, collaborating with women of color, scholars of color helps to give me energy. And so I always do my best to try to reach out to scholars of color and women to work with because... This is my way of trying to help diversify the professoriate in ways too. Like if I'm bringing them in here, that way we can like change the professoriate, even though the professoriate needs a lot of changes, especially in the German context. And so I feel like if I work with these individuals, if we work together and we help to build networks that are more inclusive, that is one way of maintaining the significance of intersectionality. And quite honestly, the second thing is that after I got, so in the U.S., you go up for tenure and then you become an associate professor. So I'm, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. And so as after obtaining tenure, I feel even more inclined to call out racism and foolishness, more so than I did pre-tenure. And I do it in a variety of ways. I, you know, advocate for scholars who come to me and say they need help. I talk about racist and messed up stuff at conferences like the German Studies Association has been racist for years. Um, I talk about, you know, white fragility and emails that I get from like white women emailing me about their guilt for being racist. Don't email me. Don't do that. So like these are all my ways of trying to like deal with like I am not a, I, you know, on the one hand, I can teach you, but on the other hand, there's also Google and that people of color shouldn't have to teach you about being a racist because that's not my job unless you're going to pay me <laughs> to do that. So I think these are the ways that I try to do that. And so your network, you guys are doing that too. You know, your women working together, highlighting the importance of diversity and inclusion and talking about it in research and pedagogy. And these are ways that we sort of show that like, intersectionality has always mattered. It's a part of our identity. It's a part of our work. And it's a part of how coalitions are built, too. When we recognize our differences, we don't ignore our differences, we can accomplish so much more. continue with our next section, the future. So I think you've already mentioned some of the changes that you're trying to contribute to, but what are some like big changes you would like to see in the upcoming years uh, regarding the research on your topic? So specifically on this area of research. I really wish that there were more professors of color in Germany. That's really... I mean, I don't know how I can change that from the U.S., but I keep saying it at events where I'm like, we need more professors of color in Germany. We need more Black professors. We need more POC professors. And what's been interesting, too, is this: I've been getting a lot more emails from students of color in Germany who want to pursue work on Black Germans in a variety of ways. And so I've been trying to, like, mentor and help those students because they're like, I don't have support You know, I'm not allowed to do this type of work, even though I really want to do this type of work. And I think that's the problem is that when scholars of color, black scholars pursue work that deals with topics about race, there's always a presumption that those topics are A, not important, 
they're, you know, they're about like, oh, they're about your identity or B, they're all about, um, they're not going to be so rigorous, that this research isn't rigorous. That's all hogwash. That's a lie. And I think I'd love for more scholars of color, more Black scholars in Germany to have the ability to do the research that they want to do. And that's an issue of access. And that's also an issue of accessibility and inclusivity. When you dismiss that this type of work isn't rigorous, when you make presumptions about this type of work in sociology and history and anthropology, et cetera, that's a problem. And that's why there needs to be more visible scholars of color who are in these positions to be able to help other scholars who want to pursue this work. It's hard. And we all know what neoliberal universities are, (laughs) who, you know, there's a, a claim of progressivism. And the same token, there's still lots of racism, structural racism in these institutions. So we can write a statement about Black Lives Matter, but then in reality, they actually don't matter at my institution. So those statements are hollow if you can't follow through with actions that mean that these lives actually matter in Germany, not George Floyd in Minnesota. Yes, his life mattered, but I need you to also address why those lives matter in the German context. Yeah, I think, as you said, we don't have much Black or people of color as professors, especially at the very top in the hierarchy. And so what I had been seeing as well, there are a lot of people of color as PhD students, for example, and I can see that, I mean, not so much, but there's a growing number of people of color as PhD students, for example. But I think it's quite hard to move the upper levels. And one thing that's also might be because of the racism that these people come across in the institutions that they're working at. So if some of those people are listening to our podcast, what would you say to them to be able to continue with the work that they're doing and until they get the professorship. Yeah, I mean, Germany, I mean, Ich bin Hanna is a hashtag that matters for a variety of reasons in the German context. Um, and then those experiences are also about the troubles that you're dealing with due to your intersectional identities. So you need people to not gaslight you. And if they're gaslighting you, they're not your peeps. Yeah, one thing I've been thinking about a lot, and again, it's a huge topic, is that we, speaking of the minorities, we always get just a very tiny piece of cake and we have to share it. So that sometimes for me, it feels like there's not enough space for all of us, for our histories, for our experiences, for our loss, our anger, um, but also our perspectives in academia. So I want to ask you, (laughs) what do you think, what can we do? about it? I think we can't see that. I mean, you're right. We only have a little bit of cake, but we have to cut those small pieces for everyone. So we have to try to build as we climb. And what I mean by that is like, when I'm reaching out and collaborating, I'm doing so in the effort that I want all of these people to be, to obtain positions in academia. And I want the space to be inclusive of their narratives, of their stories, of their experiences. And so I think we have to just share the small pieces and then maybe not eat cake and eat other things that help to sustain us. You know, like my thing is like, you can have the cake to celebrate that we're all here and then we got to eat something else together to get it done. And so I think we need to continue to work together, not at each other, not against each other. Um, And that's part of what the the sort of hierarchy, the racial hierarchy helps to do is like create all this tension so that communities of color can work together. Um, But we have to work together if we want to foster change. And that's only possible if we also recognize that we're not all the same, we're different, and that those differences shape us and that those differences don't mean we still can't collaborate together. Thanks for this wonderful picture of just having a different thing for dinner, maybe. The question is, why is it important to look back into the past And what can we learn from that for the future? The past tells us about the present and the future. The past tells us how Germans have become Germans. It tells us how race works. It tells us how it functioned. It tells us how racialization works, how exclusion works, how issues of belonging work. So the past is a great way of understanding the present and seeing where we're going in the future. And if we don't have a concept of where we've come from, then it's hard to know where we're going. 
Um, and so that's how I see history. And it's the same for, you know, thinking about my own history. Like if I don't know who I am, how can I be in the world if I don't truly know who I am? And so history is a part of that. But it's not all about white men. It's never been all about white men. And we have to decenter white men and white women sometimes, you know. I know we've, we've got women's movements, which was important, but we also need to center women of color, men of color, and we need to center these narratives too. And that's why that kind of history matters to me. That kind of post-colonial, whatever decolonial history matters because it gives us a richer picture of the past. When it's only about white men, it's not a rich picture. Thank you so much. So here comes our final question, which is, how do you stay motivated in your job? Do you have any advices for us? It's good to have therapy. <laughs> so I have a therapist that I see regularly because I need my mental health to be in a good place. And so I'm really very much about like making sure my mental health is okay so that I can be functional to do the work that I want to do. So I'm a very big advocate for therapy and mental health. I'm motivated when I see this new generation sharing their work at conferences. So um, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and there was like amazing work from Black European scholars who came, in which I was like, <gasps> and so you get, you know, it becomes generative and productive to see them. And you just want to do whatever you can to help if they want the help. You're like, hey, I'm here. I could read something. I could do whatever you need me to do. So, and I also gain a lot of energy and, um, Just happiness helping other scholars. Like, I try to do what I can for scholars. I, you know, I try to, like, if they need an article, I try to send an article. If they need help figuring out where to publish, I try to send them an idea about where they could publish. So helping other scholars, mostly helping other, you know, scholars of color brings me joy. And it also helps me see amazing work being, you know, in the progress. Amazing work in progress. So I think that I finally acknowledge that like, yeah, I like being nice and helping people. And that like helps sustain me in ways. But therapy does too, so. I'm a huge fan of therapy too, <laughs> I have to say. I have to say it helped me a lot too. Um, yeah, you just need a place where you can talk about who you are, what you're dealing with. And everyday and structural racism takes its mental toll on you. So thank you so much, Professor Tiffany Flavel, for joining us today and for helping us increase the visibility of outstanding historians as yourself and of cutting-edge research. Thank you all for listening and talk soon. We want to thank Minor Revisions for the music, Max Kersten for post-production, Lotte Koeman for logo design and Zeynep Alpay for artwork. Make sure to visit our website for bonus materials and to follow us on social media at Researching Diversity Podcast. Stay tuned and talk soon. Music